get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the park Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X. A founder, Tony Horton, he talked about how he made money as a street mine before selling hundreds of millions of dollars. Baby Einstein founder, Julie Clark, talks about growing her company to $20 million with five employees and selling to Disney, but most impressively beat cancer twice. And Atari founder, Nolan Bushnell, talked about, and we'll talk with Mitch, who is the early days of the internet too. Um, Nolan Bushnell talked about how when Steve Jobs, he was Steve Jobs' mentor, Steve offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. Um, check out more interviews on inspiredinsider.com. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with, with my business partner, John Corcoran, who Mitch also knows. At Rise25, we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners. We help you create a roadmap for the next year to the exact referral partners and clients to connect with and the content you should be creating. And we help you run your podcast so it generates ROI. And podcasting, you know, for me is much more personal. Um, it's not just about your business, it's about leaving a legacy. Um, it was inspired by my grandfather and he was a Holocaust survivor and him and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany. They were the only members of their family to survive and his legacy lives on because the Holocaust Foundation did an interview with him, which I put on my about page. So if people are interested, mm-hmm. they could check that out. So yes, podcasting will help your business, but it will help you and your guests leave a legacy of knowledge and I personally credit podcasting as the single best thing I've done for my business and my life. So if you have questions, and I think just like Mitch thinks any business that is the right business for certifications should have a certification, period. I believe if you have a business, you should have a podcast, period. So go to rise25.com. You can check out more. Contact us if you have questions. So today's guest I'm excited about, Mitch Russo. He is known as the go-to person to help companies build a certification program. So if you are thinking about creating a certification program or you don't know that you should be creating it, go to MitchRusso.com. Check out what he's about. You know, he's been doing this for decades. Um, his past clients and partners include Tony Robbins, Kevin Harrington, Chet Holmes, Josh Turner, and many more. Talk about Dream 100, right? Chet Holmes was ta- was talking about that decades ago also. In 1985, just to give you some background on Mitch, um, he co-founded Time Slips Corporation, which grew to become the largest time tracking software company in the world at the time. And in 94, Time Slips was sold to Sage for over $10 million. And Mitch went on to run all of Sage US as COO, a division with 300 people. Sage is huge. I went to the Sage Summit conference. It's it's huge. All the top you know, software and counting and things like that go to this conference. Um, he partnered with Chet Holmes and Tony Robbins to help create business breakthroughs, a company serving thousands of businesses a year with coaching, consulting, and training. And Mitch was the president and CEO and helped grow that company to over $25 million. And he's published several books, which you should check out. The Invisible Organization, which uh, is a CEO's guide to transitioning a traditional brick and mortar company into a fully virtual organization. And the book Power Tribes, which is how certification can explode your business. Check everything out at MitchRusso.com. You know, Mitch, that introduction is usually not that long, but it's much deserved from what you've created. And, you know, I know there's been stories of people reading just your book and having tremendous results. Right. And so that's right. Um, I don't know if there's one, you know, I want to start off talking about you, an early mentor for you, your dad, but first just talk about power tribes for a second. And um, I'm sure you've had some stories roll in from people who have, who have read that. Absolutely. Well, first of all, uh, if I could go back a little further, um, the story that I tell and in much more detail in the book is how all of this came about. Mm-hmm. So in building Time Slips Corporation, um, we hit a brick wall somewhere at around two and a half million dollars. And I think if you look at any business that scales uh, to 10 million and above, there's brick walls all over the place and along the way. So this particular brick wall was because we were doing so well and selling so much software. One of the problems was is we couldn't support all of our customers. We kept hiring, hiring, and hiring more support people. But it, the, the wait times were in the half hour range, and I, that was completely unacceptable. 
I would be furious if it was me waiting on the phone. And these are lawyers, no less. So <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine. So bottom line is that um, it, it, in an inspired moment, uh, a particular person, a woman with very high influence in the legal community, uh, uh, called customer service to threaten to sue us and complain that our software had destroyed her computer. Uh, and, you know, she had spent uh, retail $99 for her software and demanded that I fly someone out there immediately to fix her computer. And, uh, and of course, now customer service doesn't know how to handle this, so they connect them to the senior customer service person of last resort, Mr. Alan Singer. So, Jeremy, you probably know the punchline here. Who's Alan Singer? It's me. <laughs> so I said, hi, this is Alan. How can I help you? And she tells the story of how our software destroyed her computer. And I said, well, first of all, um, while we're talking, I've already refunded your money, but we will have somebody there in the next 48 hours to fix your computer no matter what. Now, I made that claim n not having a clue as to whether it was going to be me getting on a, you know, a red eye to go out and fix her computer. But in that moment, and she, of course, calmed down, and she was very happy and very thankful that's what we call the ambassador program. We did that with every disgruntled individual who ever called the company. Our goal was to convert them to an ambassador, and we did most of the time. In fact, practically all the time. So in this particular case, I was thinking, how am I going to get somebody out there? What am I going to do? And I had this thought, why don't I call Anne? Anne is a fan of the company, a big fan of me. Maybe I'll just ask Anne a favor because she's a heavy time slips user. To take a you know drive 20 minutes away and see if she could help this woman. So I call up Ann and she goes, oh my God, it's Mitch. How can, why are you calling me? I'm so happy to hear from you, Mitch. I said, I have a favor to ask. It's anything, anything, just tell me what you want. And I explained the situation and she jumped in her car practically and drives over there and I give her my, my home number. We didn't have cell phones back then, Jeremy. So uh, <laughs> I give her my home number and I'm waiting at my home. It's nine o'clock. 10 o'clock at night already, and I'm still up. I'm waiting to find out what happened. And the phone finally rings, and, and it's Anne. And I said, Anne, how'd it go? And she goes, oh, it went amazing. I said, really? Tell me more. She goes, well, of course, it wasn't your software that crashed her computer. And she just We just needed to do something or this or whatever she did. And then we reinstalled time slips, and everything worked fine. We recovered her database, and she's totally happy. And I go, ah. Oh. Thank goodness. Thank you, Anne, so much. She goes, oh, I didn't tell you the best part. I said, oh, what's the best part? And she says, she gave me a $100 bill. Hmm. I said, really? And this was the words that changed my life. She said, and if you need anybody else in the Los Angeles area to have any help locally, you call me and I'll go over there and help them. And that's when the light bulb went off. I said, what would happen if I had not one, not two, not 20, how about 200, 300 and scattered all over the country, willing and able to help my clients with their software? Well, that's how the certification program started. Uh, unfortunately, like every good hero's journey story, uh, there was a fairly significant failure about 60 enrollees in. Um, we enrolled somebody uh, who should never have been exposed to the public and ended up <laughs> exposed to the public. <laughs> I, I mean, through my research, Rich, I have a note that says on my notes, I'm looking at FBI question mark. So I'm right. assuming it involves that person. Yes. Yes. So this individual in particular, uh, let's just say that they were unstable. Uh, and after threatening the lives of most of my staff uh, mm. and using uh, anti-Semitic curse words heavily, um, I then I, I had another inspired decision. Yes, I did call the uh, F FBI, but I made another call to the JDL. That became the most effective tool of all because a couple of guys who probably bigger than you and I uh, knocked on his door and said, uh, you know that. Mitch Russo is a Jew, right? You know that, don't you? And the things you said, you're offending Jewish people and doing so in a public way. Do you understand the the gravity of what you've done? And the guy just started to cry. And mm. uh, next thing I know, I, now I didn't hear back from them, but two days later, I got a call from him profusely apologizing, begging my forgiveness and to please call the JDL and let them know that he did that. 
So wow. not my proudest moment, but it was, you know, I used a resource I felt like I would never, ever, ever do. Uh, but I had to because, I mean, literally our lives were being threatened. Uh, and um, bottom line is that I realized that I wasn't doing a good enough job of screening people. And more importantly, I wasn't creating a culture. And to me, that became the key to building great certification programs, of which now I've built several. It all comes down to culture. It really comes down to a code of ethics. A, a Think of it as building, creating, installing a culture so that when people join, they understand what the boundaries are. You know, it's sort of like, you know, you, you create a playpen for your children. They could do anything they want in the playpen. Well, that's what boundaries are for a certification <laughs> program. And and it served me well, and it served my clients really, really well over the years. And I stress it a lot in the book because mm. clearly it's just so important. What are some of those, a couple of the boundaries that you, that you have found to be most important that you set in place? Well, first of all, I mean, I have built uh, what I call a code of ethics. It's a 38-point code of ethics, which I distribute to my clients when we build programs like this. And they're job is to go through them and customize them for their own companies. Mm -hmm. But a few of them that are, and by the way, these are going to sound to people like you and me like common sense. But we both know that common sense isn't particularly common these days. <laughs> so we do need to make it clear. Well, I mean, it's like with are. anything, right? If like fundamental, like I always go to a virtual mentor, John Wooden, you know, which he used mm -hmm. to teach the, the best basketball players of all time how to put their socks and shoes on, right? And it yeah. goes down to the fundamentals of exactly. things, right? So, exactly. Yeah. So one of the things we talk about is how to show up. You know, uh, we had stories, um, you know, I ended up, by the way, calling every single person who experienced our first batch of certified consultants, and the stories were unbelievable. People showing up looking like Elmer Fudd. You know, they, they basically had body odor that you could, sense them coming, you know, 30 feet away, not good. So we had to talk about hygiene, personal hygiene. We had to talk about appearance. We had to talk about matching tones. When you go into an office, you know, if you just got a ticket, you can't be angry walking into, so you would think these are things that you should know, but they're not. They're the like putting on your basketball shoes and socks the right way. So we go through some of that, but the other things are more important in a sense, or those, those are too. For example, who owns the intellectual property? You know, after all, you just poured your heart and soul into these certified consultants. You taught them almost everything you know, and you're sending them off into the world. So there has to be some rules. Number one, they don't own what you just taught them. Number two, they can't compete with you, no matter what, with your own intellectual property. Now, these are what we call some of the basic fundamentals of the code of ethics, you know? And then there are others that uh, relate to how you treat people and how you treat others in the program. But the, some of the lessons are for the CEO too. Mm -hmm. You know, I learned a, a lesson the hard way by playing favorites. You know, I had a guy come up to me and goes, I, I love your software, I'm a certified consultant, I'm one of your top certified consultants, Mitch, and I wanna, as a, my gift to you, I wanna convert the entire program into Spanish. I said, oh, sure, go right ahead, thanks. OK, but now all of a sudden he's an FOM and that immediately set him as, apart from everybody else in the program. FOM is friend of Mitch. Right. So he claims he's now my friend. And he's doing this for Mitch because Mitch asked me to, which I didn't. And next thing I know, I've now created a strata, a level, something different than everybody else, which was never my intention. Mm. And then more people volunteered to do stuff. And I thought, oh, that's wonderful. Go right ahead. And once again, what I'm doing is I'm building a barrier between others, not serving me or my company. And by the way, because they offered to do it for free and I had nothing in writing, they could claim later that I agreed to pay them and didn't anything they wanted. So one of the things that I try and teach my, my CEO clients is never accept free gifts when it comes to work always have a contract in place before you do something and know in advance what the outcome will be and be happy to pay for it. You know, and, and so these are the, the things you gain in maturity <laughs> uh, and the lessons that I try to pass on to my clients and save them, my goodness, all the years it took me to learn them. So those are the important things and, and many more things related to, for example, uh, any program I build can never, we can never sell certification to an individual ever. We only sell certification to a corporation. 
And the reason is, is because we don't want to have the state taxing authorities come after my clients for back taxes or employment taxes or any of those things. So one of the key elements of a a good program is that when we bring someone on board, we make sure that they are an LLC and they have a federal ID number. Without that, they can't play. It's Mm -hmm. that simple. You started off doing certification internally for your own companies. I'll talk about. I want to talk about who was the first notable company um, that you did it for externally. But talk about first, Mitch. What's some of the criteria? You mentioned it's got to be an LLC corporation. What What are some of the criteria for someone who could, should consider doing a certification program? Yeah, that's a great question um, because I think a lot of people say, "Oh, yeah, I'd love to build a certification program," but they haven't thought through any of the elements of what it really takes to do it. So I mean, it seems one, great, right? You have an external yeah. workforce. It oh, yeah. adds low hanging fruit dollars and a lot of other, you know, uh, business lines. So, right. yeah. But so here, here's the basic thing. And, and I, uh, I have been approached by many different people in many different fields to do this for them. And I turn down several because they're not in the right, they're not, they're not in the right place. And I'll explain what I mean. So, and, and you'll see clearly this in about 30 seconds. So if you're a software company, uh, if you are a coach, if you are a training company, uh, if you are a medical device company, in other words, if you have intellectual property that requires skill to implement on behalf of your client, then that is the place to start. Now, what I mean by that. And some examples would be, for example, we had a client who came to us who had the equivalent of an Invisalign appliance, but it would require that before they could sell it to another orthodontist, that orthodontist had to be trained. Now, they were running quarterly training sessions, but it was going slowly. You know, you're basically taking a dentist out of his own business for, for a week. And instead, what we talked about is building certification, where instead we can create certification all over the country and have local dentists go in and train them on site and their sales would blow up if they did that. And so that would be an example of a medical device. Software is easy. I mean, my software, Time Steps Corporation, we built a certification program second time around, went to 350 people and growing, generating all kinds of cash, all kinds of sales channels, all kinds of benefits to the company decimated the competition because now we had 350 offices all over the country. My competitors couldn't even come close to that. But other companies like like Salesforce and, and like Infusionsoft and like HubSpot and all of these companies are perfect because they have a product that requires some help implementing. Uh, training, sales training, perfect example. I mean, you could teach sales training all day long, but imagine if instead you had 350 sales training offices like Sandler does to some degree. The only difference is, <clears throat> is that Sandler, um, uh, well, I'm not going to speak of another company because I don't know them intim- intimately enough, but I know with my clients, when we put somebody in the field, they are operating at the competency level of the creator of that technology or that transformation because I will accept no less and neither will they. So those are the people that are basic prospects. Now, step two is how many clients have you done this with already? And if the answer is, well, I've I've done it with seven clients, the answer is, well, then you're not ready for certification. And the reason is, it's not just the obvious reason, like you don't have enough experience yet to have perfected the process, which is a part of it. The bigger picture is that if we're going to build a business division called certification, we have to start somewhere. And the most and most profitable, easiest, pleasurable way to start is with my own clients. If I'm going to do it, I want to start with my own clients. Well, one of the things that um, that Chet taught me long ago was the fact that it would, and he used to call it the stadium pitch. You know, if you, if you brought a million people into a stadium, uh, but the only criteria is that they don't have to stay, but you have their attention for at least the first 90 seconds. So those who stay will probably buy. So <clears throat> this is the same sort of thing. So if you have a client base and you have 500 clients and you look at the early adopter uh, concept, which means that when anything new is released, 
two, three, five percent at most are going to jump right away. Why? Because they love you. Why? Because they're naturally early adopters, and uh, and also because they see it as an opportunity. So when you have less than five hundred people, then two or three percent of five hundred is not quite enough to build that pilot class. I like to see a minimum of 10 people in a pilot class. And if you get 2% adoption, then 500 is about the right number. 1,000 is better uh, because we can fill a pilot class to 20. I don't let pilot classes get above 20. And the reason is, is because, heck, they're pilot classes. There's going to be problems in a pilot. That's what pilots are for. They're to uncover the problems, fix them, and then roll it out in a much bigger way. So when you join the when a, when a client uh, finally launches and they have their clients join the pilot, they get a discount, they get extra attention, they get all kinds of showered with with attention basically to make sure that and guarantee they got to be successful because without success we can't take their testimonials and use those to market to the bottom of the pyramid as we as we continue the process. Make sense? Totally. What are some of the common mistakes people make when implementing cert, you know, certification programs? I'm sure you see a lot of them, even with, well, with guidance in the beginning. That's what pilots are for. But Well, you know, I've been brought in to fix coaching organizations mm. uh, several times now. And the most common mistake is what we talked about early on is building culture. Mm. Uh, so most... Most uh, coaching programs and some certification programs start casually, like, oh, uh, my brother said he'd volunteer to talk to some customers, and over three to six months, he's gotten to know the product, so he's a certified consultant now. I mean, there's never been any formal, true training testing process, and one of the things that I reveal in the book is how to tell whether someone has 100% competency, or how to train someone to... 100% 100% competency guaranteed. And and the reason that that's important is because even 98% isn't quite good enough if what you're teaching somebody would affect and change their lives. It needs to be 100%. And, and there's a way to do that that's not that hard. Tony taught it to me. And I now work with my clients and we do this all the time. So You, you know, Mitch, you never set out to be like, I want to build and help companies do certifications. You just did it for yourself. You found it was successful, and then you started helping others. Who, after you, was a, a good, um, you know, notable example that you then helped afterwards? Well, you know, it's funny because a lot of the concepts that I uh, invented and created by building certification for my own company was was picked up by my friend Scott Cook, who was the founder of Intuit. So Scott came to me and said, "Hey." What are you doing? How did how did you get 350 certified consultants? Uh, we want to do that too. He says, "Can I have your like? Can you tell me how to do it and give me your give stuff? me your playbook, right? Give me your playbook." And I said, "Scott, for you, yes, uh, because I knew that I had a favor I could ask later uh, <laughs> if right. I did that. Uh, and that favor, by the way, was to get exclusive access into the source code of his software that I could link time slips to." which he granted me later down the road, which was amazing. So I had a a big edge in that regard too. But so Scott basically took the manual that I gave him and he basically gave it to his team and the team dissected it and they built the certified advisor program, which is thousands of CPAs now as a result. Uh, But, but after, you know, Chet and Tony, after we broke up, after that company ended, um, I had a conversation with Josh Turner. Now, I know you know Josh. Mm -hmm. Others who don't, he's the CEO of Linked Selling. And uh, in this conversation, which I was actually doing something completely different, we were, I was trying to share with him how we used to run a very successful webinar program. Um, And I, either I mentioned it or he mentioned it. And then he said to me, could you do that for us? I said, "Uh, yeah, of course. And of course I hadn't done it really in 20 years. Uh, And he said, uh, well, when can we start? And I said, uh, Friday. I was, I was, now, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, so I didn't know what to charge. I d- didn't have any, you know, materials, no blueprinting done. I had nothing really. So he was patient enough with me as I worked all of this stuff out, and uh, and we built his program in ten and a half weeks, and it launched and it became a six figure program instantly. 
Hmm. And he was thrilled. I was thrilled. And um, I realized that, hey, I could actually um, work with clients like Josh to do this over and over again. Uh, And so it was really my... uh, you know, my friendship with Josh and his patience with me as I built that first program that led to me doing this now, I would say almost 60% of my work comes from certification. There's probably different factors that lead to a successful certification, you know, certification program and launching a successful certification program. What are some of the key elements in actually, okay, the team's ready to go. Now we got to launch this thing. Right. So, so one of the things <clears throat> that I have perfected is a launch formula for this. And it's, uh, you know, are indeed uh, from, um, you know, the product launch formula that Jeff we're all Walker's, familiar with. Yeah. yeah, Jeff Walker's thing. So R&D, by the way, stands for rip off and deploy. So, yeah. <laughs> so I are indeed Jeff Walker's program. Uh, and I borrowed elements of it. And not, not wholesale. I mean, I took the idea of it in the three videos. But what, what I constructed with, with the help of Josh and with some other clients is we, we created a scenario that positions our potential customers as going from where they are to where they truly want to be in a way that is so compelling that people jump to sign up even if the program's twenty or $30,000. And, um, and it's not magic. It's really just stating the facts of reality today. And some of those facts are quite obvious. Uh, You know, we don't live in a world anymore where you get a job for 40 years and retire. Uh, You have to to understand that the only way to truly be, not the only way, but the way many of us have chosen to be successful is to go out on our own and create a business. Well, okay, um, and we did that. And that world, you know, of being the independent business consultant is a very hard road to travel for the beginner in particular. However, what we've created is a massive system that will not only just allow you to express yourself as a business consultant, but more important, give you a powerful tool set that you can implement that's guaranteed to work every time, and more importantly, make a fantastic living doing it. And then the scenario that we paint is, look, this is the world, This is where the world is going, and if you don't go there, you will be left behind. And then the third video is how to get there using our system and what you will be once you're there. And in a summary form nutshell, that's the process that we use. And, and, you know, we work on a custom script for every client, but we start with a core script. And the core script is a story, and it's once we tell the story in the voice of whoever is my client at the time, that story becomes super compelling. Mitch, you know, how should a company think about pricing their certification program? I know it probably varies widely. I'm so glad you asked that question. Nobody asks me that question. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it just made me think of it because when you're helping launch it, you got to charge something. And you mentioned, you know, even charging a large amount for this, this structure works. Yes. So here's here's the the first question that we explore together one on one if in my relationship with my client. My my question to my to the CEO to my client would be if somebody were doing this how much could they make? So like for example in Josh Turner's case um he felt like people people could make in an engagement a few thousand dollars, 3 to 4 5000 dollars. And Her then I would say Per engagement. So right. I said, well, how many engagements could they have? And then we pick the number. And ultimately, what we're looking for is we're looking to figure out what the average person could generate from doing this thing, whatever that thing is. And then we ask ourselves, what would happen if we took that number and we divided it by five? So if they made five times what they paid for certification every year, would they re-up the following year? So what it comes down to is we're reverse engineering ROI. And yeah. once we do that, the prices become quite obvious. So usually- It like becomes I, a no-brainer, you know. It becomes a no-brainer. We just got finished with a, a program for a client um, and their certification fees is gonna be $25,000 a year, period. 
no discount for year two. And why? Because the ROI is so high that you'd be crazy not to do it for year two or three or four. Yeah, I think you have a title for your next book, Reverse Engineering ROI. That's right. <laughs> That's exactly um, right. You know, it, it, um, it's interesting because um, are there any other, you know, but Josh Turner is a good example. What other maybe not um, that similar type of program, maybe a medical device, SaaS or coaching, um, what would be a good example to talk about maybe in a different sect? Sure. So I'll talk about my last client. Uh, we just finished up with him and he's, he, he just emailed me and told me he's having a problem keeping up with sales. I, I feel so bad That's for the guy. It's a good problem. I yeah. know. It's yeah. terrible. Uh, they're selling so much of it they can barely keep up. So, so he – and this is kind of interesting because it's not traditional. He's in the real estate training business. Hmm. So he trains people to buy properties and build a business around owning – single family homes and multifamily units. And when he first came to me, I was like a little confused. I said, yeah, okay, uh, tell me more. Why, why do you want certification? Because <clears throat> I almost didn't get it at first. But then what he said is, he goes, look, um, a lot of the people that I work with want, love this so much they want to teach it. And we, of course, want to sell more of it. So if we certify them in this process of building real estate empires, then we'll sell more product, we'll sell certification, and they will be able to help many, many more clients than we can alone. So I said, jeez, oh, you're right. You're absolutely right. And, and so we did it, and we built this program. Now, one of the things we haven't talked about yet is the personality of the person who signs up for certification. Do you mind if I yeah, take go a ahead. minute? Yeah, go ahead. So what it really comes down to is most people who are good at coaching – we're good at buying real estate or good at being a dentist are not very good at selling. I don't know if you've noticed or, that. But, or they may and they don't like it. Right. Or they may not like it. So if you instead were to go out today and buy John Maxwell's coaching certification, uh, I think it's $18,000. And what you'd get is this very beautiful piece of paper. I think there's some gold leaf on the paper. Uh, and you can hang that on your wall. Isn't that exciting? So here you are now. I'm a John Maxwell certified coach. And I got this on my wall here. Uh, but then the mortgage is due. I, I can't like snap a picture of it and send it in. They don't accept that. I somehow got to take the skill that I just acquired and find a way to sell it. And I'm not very good at selling, uh, which is why I'm a coach, let's say. So right away, we hit the very biggest problem that any of my clients and yeah. I, we solve it first. So here's the simplest way to solve the problem. We do it for them. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, um, we have prospects. And what we do is we, we basically provide a steady stream of prospects with a sales closing system that we teach them that our company host, the, my client, has used for sometimes decades to close sales that they guarantee works. So all of these things must, like an intricate puzzle, must all fit together cohesively and in, a, in perfect symmetry or else none of this works. And so someone is a prospect for me and they say, well, I don't know. <clears throat> we can barely get enough prospects for our own company. Why would we go and try and pay money to spend to get prospects for our certified consultants. I said, you're missing the point. They're paying you. First of all, you, you've ignored the fact that you already have an enormous base of prospects to give them to start with. And they say, no, we don't. What do you mean? I said, well, you told me you had a thousand clients, right? Well, I'm going to take a wild guess. You have a database of 10,000 to 20,000 people who never bought but have expressed interest in your products. And they'll go, well, yeah, of course, we will. everyone has that. I said, right. But what would happen now if we went back to those same people and said, hey, remember when you wanted to buy our stuff but turned us down? Well, how about if we gave you a free coach for four sessions and, and not charge you any extra money at all, but do this because we want to get you going and we want to make sure that you're getting everything you're paying for out of the product. Would you buy now? And interestingly enough, eight to 10% of that prospect base is going to say yes. Hmm. That becomes the base of prospects for our first batch of certified consultants. So it didn't even cost us money 
to feed our certified consultants that first batch prospects. But now we're certifying people at twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars. We're getting ten, twenty, thirty people per quarter saying yes to certification. <clears throat> Let's not be pigs. Let's take fifteen percent <laughs> of the right. money that we're generating and dedicate it to marketing for our certified consultants, generating leads for our certified consultants. And then I describe a lot of different cool tricks. So one of the things that all of my clients do on my in insistence is they hire a PR person whose only job it is is to get local speaking engagements in the area of every single certified consultant. So we, we have somebody, typically an intern, who we train, sit on the phone, call the uh, the Michigan Bar Association, find out where the local offices are, and call them up and say, hey, would you like to get an expert on whatever their process is to come and speak to your group? And they're gonna go, sure, are you kidding? Then we set them up as Vistage speakers. We teach them how to become Vistage speakers. So before you know it, our, our internal PR person is generating speaking opportunities for every single certified consultant we're generating prospect lead flow every single day for our certified consultants. And we have a dedicated CRM on the back end of our website just for our certified consultants. That's the trick. Thanks the for secret. sharing that, Mitch. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, I know for me, if I was signing up to do a certification, the most compelling argument or piece that I could know is, oh, you're going to hand me clients? Then it becomes even more of a no-brainer. Yeah. Well, in, in one program, we actually handed people closed clients. In one program that, that we built, we said, you know what? Why don't we just close them for our certified consultants? They don't care about that anyway. They just care about providing the consulting and coaching element of it. And next thing you know, we have a multi-hundred person coaching organization that pays us every year to be our coach. Uh, duh, what's wrong with that picture? I mean, and do you recommend someone have a marketplace on their website or does that not give the company enough control over their certified partners? When you say a marketplace, you know, do you like, um, you know, directory? if you, if you, yeah, directly, like you've digital, let's say digital marketer had like a marketplace of their certified partners in certain areas no. or anything like that. No, 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 it doesn't work. It, it, first of all, it doesn't work. Second of all, if you say it, you have a page that says, would you like to have a certified consultant come to your facility, work with you directly, enter your name and address here. And at that point, if initially we'd start calling people and then recommending them. But once we understand kind of what people are looking for, we would have the software do that for us. But mm. never, never, never. I mean, why publish a directory of everybody? I mean, why don't we just hand our competitors our source code at the same time? Mm -hmm. you know, just to make it easy, right? <laughs> Might as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple questions. Um, you know, I want to hear some interesting story. I know you have a lot of interesting stories. Tony Robbins, Kevin Harrington, Chet Holmes. But I want to start with the most important, uh, which is your dad. Um, yeah. Your early mentor, he, I believe, started candy stores. What That's was right. he? Yeah, he started candy That's stores. Right. So w talk about a little bit what you learned from your dad and what you saw him doing, how you helped, you know, what you did early on as a kid, because I'm sure that, you know, kind of fueled your entrepreneur spirit. Absolutely. And I, I dedicated my, my second book to my dad who's passed, but mm. he, you know, he Sorry taught me that. so much. Um, I remember one day uh, I'm at the store. We just finished. He finished building a brand new store on Canal Street in New York. And uh, they're installing the the roaster. The, they, his stores all had nut roasters because they always had fresh nuts. But he's installing the nut roaster in the front of the store, venting out the window. Mm. So they cut the window. And I said, Dad, why don't you put that in the back? You're blocking the window. He goes, watch. I'll show you why. And he puts a batch of cashews in and he turns on the roaster. And 45 minutes at 8 o'clock in the morning, 45 minutes later, we had a line outside the store. Wow. So People I were said, just walking by. Yeah. Where is that coming from? <laughs> That's right. That's right. So my dad taught me marketing in mm. in the most basic way. And he he didn't he wasn't a copywriter. I mean, there wasn't any of that stuff going on. He just understood the psychology of how to generate people wanting things. Mm -hmm. And he 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 did this over and over again in many of his businesses. Um, one one day it was a, it was a, it was um, a 
Easter. And uh, he he said to me, uh, tomorrow, it was the day before Easter, he said, tomorrow, uh, we're getting up early and we're going into New York. Uh, and I said, great, because I always loved hanging with my dad. I said, what are we doing? He goes, we're selling Easter baskets. I said, really? Uh, you mean we're opening the store? He goes, no, no, the store's closed. Uh, we're, we're selling Easter baskets. I said, where? He goes, I'm not, I'm not sure yet. So we're driving around now Sunday morning and, and we're, we're just driving. And then all of a sudden he goes, okay, let's stop. And on the street, there was a door that someone had thrown away. So he found two boxes and he propped up the door. And then we emptied the car of all the baskets that we had. And we set up on the street, on a random street corner, and we sold every basket that we could fit into the car before 11 a.m. Wow. I mean, my dad just knew that if you, on Easter, came up with Easter baskets and showed up in a public place, you'd sell them. <laughs> and it was intuitive stuff like this. Yeah, he that, just had a knack for looking around, where's the best spot? And he found the spot on the corner that's trafficked and just set up shop. Yeah, yeah. And to him, shop was a door. It was just a discarded door on, on balanced by a couple of boxes. I mean, that's the stuff that, I mean, and those lessons are really how I started Time Slips. Mm. You know, we only started the company with $5,000 and that doesn't go very far. Um, and so we went to our first trade show um, I literally, I mean, imagine walking into legal tech in New York City, and the only thing we could afford was the sign, the paper sign, and the table. We couldn't even afford the, the, the skirt on the table, so we brought a sheet. And now we throw the sheet on the table, and Talk about we bootstrapping. Put, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we put this, this basically a rented television set connected to a laptop. And we were the most popular booth in the entire show. All these multi-million dollar booths, Thompson and Company, all these big legal software names. We had more traffic than all of them because we had something new and exciting and, and it was causing a buzz. So a lot of that came from just watching how my dad did stuff, you know? What was, what was your dad's stores like? What was in there? You mentioned the, the nuts. What else did oh, he have in there? Well, he had, so, so my, my, um, my dad, on my dad's side, my family is from Turkey. Mm -hmm. And and so they imported halava for the first time mm. into the United States. So we used to get these big wheels of halava and, and we would slice it up and give people tastes and we'd sell the whole wheel out that day, you know. So um, we would sell more, we sold standard stuff, packaged candy to some degree, but most of the store <clears throat> were custom things. Like for example, um, he would take caramel nuts and chocolate and put them in a little paper cup and sell them for 25 cents. Well, the cost of that, th those ingredients, the cost of that was less than three cents, but he would never be able to get those type of profit margins on packaged candy. Mm. So he figured out what would be the best and unique and profitable and offer it to people. And it was, it was all, he was just about always right. Mitch, take me back to that time candy wise. What were your favorite candies? What was the candy of that of that time? Like the package candy of that era? Well, I mean, clearly there was Pez, there was mm. uh, you know, there was Good and Plenty, that was one of my favorites. Mm. Um there were um I'm trying to remember the name of them. Jeez, I, I wish you would have prepared me, I would have done the research. <laughs> now I will tell you this. Uh you're you're in New York, aren't you? Uh, Chicago. Oh, you said that's yeah. Chicago. Well, in New York there's a store called Economy Candy, and that store was founded by my dad and his father, my grandfather. Wow. Uh, and it's still there to this day. And so we would uh, go to the candy store, uh, you know, when in the early days, and I would work there at the store. And I learned a lot about business and transactions and inventory from just hanging out at the store with my dad. Um, and so when he built the store, he chose – candies that were unusual as opposed to the regular stuff but the stuff that i really liked uh, and I'm, I'm just thinking now as i'm i'm going back to some of the uh old time favorites from that day i mean i don't know if you remember a thing called uh rocky road which was like a, a chocolate bar i loved those and of course there was always pez and and uh i don't know licorice strings of licorice um i mean all that stuff. Uh, I, I wasn't a big baseball 
fan, but you know, I loved baseball cards mostly for the gum. Yes. So, you know, it was just stuff rock like solid that. gum has been in the package rock for for a year or two years. I'll still eat it. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, any other lessons that really stick out from your dad that he either he you know sat you down and talked to you or he just uh, observing? Well, you know, it was very interesting. We, my dad uh, was a Depression era dad. Uh, he grew up in the Depression era, and he told us all the stories of how he had to melt lead out of the milk containers to get enough money to feed the family when he was a little boy. And But the story, that the, the phrase that he left me with, which served me so well, and I've taught this to many people, I've mentioned it many times, he says, you know, Mitchell, money is round. It rolls in and it rolls out. Hmm. And his point was, don't get infatuated by money because it comes and goes. Hmm. And if if you don't want it to come and go, you need to learn how to make it stay. And to me, that was like an incredible lesson. I have watched many of my contemporaries back in the 80s and 90s sell their companies and later be penniless, basically, working, you know, working at jobs. Why? Because they didn't understand that money is round, you know. Unless you're careful, it's going to roll out after it rolled in. <laughs> yeah. And so that was one of my favorite things that he taught me. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Of um, Tony Robbins story. Favorite Tony Robbins story. Uh, I know there's a bunch. I know there's one that involves your daughter. Uh, I don't know. But, you know, a story that kind of talks about your uh, relationship with Tony Robbins and his, his lesson that he imparted on you. Well, I mean... If I were to go back and try and <clears throat> distill and encapsulate everything I've learned from Tony, it would take a long time. But the thing that sticks out to me is the integrity of the spoken word. Um, Tony has a way of never speaking before he thinks. Tony doesn't get – I mean people will disagree because they're only looking at the surface. Tony doesn't get angry. He gets urgent, and there's a big difference. Hmm. I've watched how he treats people when he gets urgent versus others when they get angry, and he treats everyone, everyone with respect. And more importantly, he understands the psychology of how problems are solved. He also understands a deeper level. One of the things I learned from Tony, and I'll never forget this, is that when there's an issue between people, Many times there's a secretive third party to blame. And I didn't understand this until I watched him dissect the problem right in front of my eyes where there was a third party spreading rumors about one of the two people that were in the middle of this disagreement. And immediately I said to myself, why isn't he dealing with the problem? And because I didn't because I figured he would deal with the two people in particular, but instead he dealt with. He went deeper and found out who the third party was who was telling them what this other person, quote unquote, did, and they didn't. But it wasn't until I watched him do that that I truly understood that there's a whole nother level of human psychology that Tony plays with in his toolbox every single day that is beyond extraordinary. And and I learned a lot of that from him throughout the years. And I told you before, I learned, I learned how to help <clears throat> people create training programs that guarantee 100% uh, comprehension. And it's not that it's hard, by the way. It's just that if you got to pay attention carefully to these several important points. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Mitch, Chet Holmes. Oh, goodness. Um, <clears throat> Chet and I um, met each other because he was a salesman calling on me. And he was trying to sell me advertising uh, when I was building time slips. And he was so persistent that it was almost a joke. It was like he was a, a, a character in a comic book, his persistence. What was, was he doing? Well, he would never give up. He would never stop calling. He would never stop mailing me things. He would never stop visiting. I mean, this guy was the, the – if you looked up persistence in the dictionary, his face would be there. He would just – the type of person that when he wanted something, he would not stop until he got it. He used to tell the story that it took 17 years to get in front of Tony Robbins to have that conversation. And when he did, we built a company together. So Chet was a master. 
at understanding how to get people to do things in a way that benefited them. And if you've read his book, The Ultimate Sales Machine, which is a Bible of mine, someone said that I'm in the book four times. I think he uses me as a reference and uses me as a testimonial and all this other stuff. We were, we were best friends. I mean, we built our friendship. He said to me one day, he said to me, he goes, you and I, we're going to be best friends. You'll see. Hmm. I, I mean, bought I, that book and I printed, uh, bought it. There was a, a online version. I printed it out and put it in a binder. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> to tell you the truth, the book is so packed with incredible wisdom. Um, and now that he's gone, of course, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's a classic but the things in that book are the things we lived every day. You know, all of the stuff that he teaches in that book are the elements of how we built business breakthroughs. So, you know, when he talked about Core Story, we built a Core Story division. Uh, when he talked about Dream 100, we built an entire sales division around Dream 100. We ate our own dog food. We used all of the tools to create business breakthroughs. And uh, one of the chapters in the book became how he and I got started working together, chapter five, uh, which is basically how to hire sales superstars. And it turns out that uh, I jumped in and started to help him and Ted uh, do some hiring until eventually, you know, when I started seeing how they were doing it, I said, there's got to be a better way. And I started using some of my so software and technology skills and automated the entire process. And so once I did, I perfected it even deeper than Chet had in the book. Chet told me before he died that I actually interviewed more people than he ever did. Um, and so a lot of what I learned from Chet were the core elements, and then I would need to take them to the next level to make them useful to me in, in implementing in the business. Uh, but, I mean, Chet was the type of guy, we'd go to Las Vegas for a trade show, and he said, come on, come on, let's go. I said, where are we going? He goes, we're going to over to. We're going to sneak into the theater and sit in the front row of the show that's going on right now. I said, "Yeah, but we don't have tickets." He goes, "I don't worry about it. Come on," and I would go with him. You know, I'd say, and I would, in my ethics would be, I would never, you know, steal anything, and that's kind of like stealing. But it was so much fun, and that was his nature was mischievous, you know, and and so I would, I, I became his, his sidekick, if you will, in so many cases. So we would do things like that all the time. But Chet loved life, you know. He loved his family. Um, we had an incredible friendship. Uh, and then unfortunately, you know, uh, when he when he contracted leukemia, um, one of the first things that happened to him was he had a mini stroke. And uh, wow. a lot of the barrier between emotions and thinking sort of got distorted for him. And a lot of the raw emotion uh, of being disappointed about being sick and even deeper started to come out. Uh, as it does in many people who who have uh, strokes of that sort. So it became very difficult in the last 16, 18 months with Chet. I, I, I was there the, the day before he died in his room talking to him. Mm. Next next morning he was gone. I left that he was night. really young, Mitch. 53. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he was. Wow. He was. Thanks for sharing some of those stories. Um, and and I, I remember his book. I, I've read the book. It's amazing. Um, I always ask this, Mitch, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask what's been an especially low moment that you had to push through? Because as you know, as a entrepreneur, business owner, there's just lots of, of moments that are ups and downs. And then what's been a proud moment on the other side of things? What's been um, a challenging moment? moment or low moment you remember that you had to really push through this week this month this year this quarter I this mean, hour you know, no this i mean hour. I'll, yeah i'll I'm tell just you the, anything in the, in yeah. the past that that strikes you yeah i got a great story okay so so when i met my partner neil um the way we met was because i was having a problem with trying to deduct my personal computer from my taxes and so i shared that problem with my brand new next door neighbor neil neil air and um, we, we became friends. We started going to lunch and breakfast. And I told them, look, the only way I can solve this problem is I have to write a software program to keep records of usage on my computer. And without two beats, six weeks later, he shows up at my house, tells me to come on over. And he shows me a program that he wrote to keep track of time on the computer. And I had this declaration. He said, you know, we could sell a couple of these. Those were my words. And uh, so 
we continued to meet for breakfast and refine the process. And meanwhile, I wrote the manual and, and he wrote the software and I started figuring out how to build the business and what channels, blah, blah, blah. Well, we both quit our jobs. My job was in sales. I was selling semiconductors. I quit and I was now working full time for my own company, Time Slips Corporation. He did the same thing. The day after we quit, the IRS relaxed the rulings on contemporaneous record keeping. So the last nine months of work were now completely gone. No purpose whatsoever. Let's call that a disappointment, a disappointing moment. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. So we had burned the boats. So at this point, there was no going back. So uh, after throwing some stuff around and screaming and ranting and raving, we said, okay, what do we got? Let's do an assessment here. What do we got? We got this software. It's pretty amazing. Uh, what can we do with it? Who else might use it? Who else might need it? And then we came up with the idea of maybe lawyers could. Maybe we could use it to build time. And so we did a pivot at that time. We ended up going another three months to finish the software and build it out so that it's at least MVP, min minimally viable product, so that we could sell it. And that one mistake, that mistake of building the wrong thing first, was the blessing that turned us into a, a a figure company. So had we not had that not happened to us and we given up and walked away, we would have both been back at jobs three months later. Instead, we built this incredible company together. So, you know, and one of the greatest um, moments in my life uh, is also part of that story, too, because my partner happens to have been, his family is a very wealthy, wealthy, wealthy family. Uh, they have a building somewhere that does nothing but manage the family's money. I'm sure you know what those are like. Well, he grew up feeling useless throughout his life. Uh, he couldn't get a job because mm. people realized that he doesn't even care about the money, which wasn't really true, but that's what they thought. So his, unfortunately, rich the, the children of rich people suffer in this way because they never really have a purpose as it relates to money. But when we sold the company, he actually put millions of dollars back into the family trust and was the first person in 200 years wow. to, to do that. And he gave me all the credit, which I didn't deserve. And to his family, he was a hero hmm. be because he was the only one to ever actually go back and return money to the trust. And I was I was a member of the family. From the day that we began our business together, uh, mm -hmm. I became a member of his family. And I was treated that way. And, and, uh, and, and he's today still one of my best friends in the world. Wow. Mitch, I want to be the first one to thank you. This has been absolutely fantastic. I want to point people towards your website, MitchRusso.com. They can also go to MyPowerTribe.com. Anywhere else we should point people towards online to check out more about what you're working yeah, on. They can go to PowerTribesBook.com and get the free course that goes with that it. That sounds fantastic. I'm going to get it now. So, cool. Mitch, thank you again. My pleasure. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, nice like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.